Hello and welcome everyone to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. We're really excited to have you here. Um, it's a hot day. It's been hot. Uh, we'll hear from Pat Ganan here in just a few minutes and he'll inform us about that. But uh, I just really want to say we enjoy doing this. We learn a lot because you have great questions and we learn from each other and we just, I, I can't say enough about how much we really enjoy doing this for you. On today, we've got a couple of great folks that are going to be uh, presenting and answering your questions. We've had a number of pictures that came in, which is really cool and exciting. That helps us to answer those questions that you guys put into the chat box or put into the questions that you send to us. Some pictures are always very, very helpful. So today we have uh, Dr. Pat and Ann from campus is going to talk to us about the weather. Donna Oftenberg down in Cape Girardeau is with us, as well as Kelly McGowan down in Springfield, Jennifer Shooter up in Kirksville, and then myself, I'm Debbie Kelly, and behind the scenes, we always have Jared. Uh, he's important for us and does a lot of great things. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and turn this over. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot another very important person who's going to present today, and that's Dr. Sam Polly, And he's got some information that you guys are probably going to want to know about, so we're happy to have Sam on uh, with us today for talking about the garden hour. So uh, now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Pat with the weather report. Sounds good. Thank you, Debbie. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, we, we're, we're in July, but I think it feels like we've been in July for several weeks now with all the heat. I do believe that all eyes are looking up uh, at the sky now because we, we need some rain. Uh, we have some notable dryness that has emerged over the past several weeks in some areas, especially southern parts of Missouri. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but we did have some storms move in overnight from Iowa and southeast Nebraska, but they unfortunately they were weakening as they swept through northern Missouri. But nonetheless, there were some areas that did receive from rainfall. This is a map on the left of all the Coker observations as of 7 a.m. this morning. You can see um, parts of Marion and Lewis and Clark County on over to Scotland, Scotland and Skyler County picked up <clears throat> generally a half inch or so, an inch of rain in Marion County. So that's very welcome relief in that part of the state and far, far northeastern sections. A couple areas in around DeKalb County and over in Livingston County had over a half inch. But for the most part, the, the, the amounts have been light. There were some uh, additional activity that fired up earlier or this morning that dropped some rainfall across uh, northeast Missouri and in the lower right <clears throat> these are the totals since midnight and Monroe City had over a half inch even in Brunswick here in Carroll County picked up a little over a half inch but still this is uh, scattered it's it's localized and it's not widespread in regard to significant rainfall and that's really what we need for our state hopefully uh, things will change over the next few days but it's not looking terribly encouraging, especially over the southern half of the state, which is the driest. Over the past week on the left, these are radar estimates. We did have a system, a couple of systems that impacted west central Missouri, uh, parts of southern Missouri, but again, very scattered and localized. There are some areas that got over two inches and in the same county, they got nothing. Um, that's pretty much been the story that we've seen. And it's not too atypical because July and August tend to be that type of uh, widely scattered afternoon thunderstorms. Nonetheless, this was nice to see some parts of central Missouri get some rain in southeast Missouri, but overall on the right over the, the past week, you can see these are the totals over the past seven days from Kokoraz observers. Again, highly localized. Um, look in here over four inches in northeastern Henry County uh, near Windsor, Missouri. Uh, southern around Jeff City, they had over two and a half inches, but here up in Boone County, there were some areas that seen, saw less than a quarter of an inch. Again, highly localized. We need a more widespread significant event because we have drought emerging across parts of Missouri, especially the southern parts of the state. Since June 2nd, so what is that? June 2nd through uh, today, that's 35 days. These are the totals on the, on the left of accumulated precipitation. I want to focus on in South Central Missouri. You look at these totals right here in Ozark County, Douglas, parts of Texas, right? Oh, Ripley, Carter, Shannon, oh, Oregon County, some really meager amounts. Regardless of antecedent conditions, which were wet in May, when you receive that little amount of rainfall as we go into summer over a 35-day period, we're seeing drought. 
And so we're seeing the impacts. They are showing up across much of Southern Missouri. I would, I would just say, looking at this, the heart of that drought is south central parts of the state bordering Arkansas. On the right, these are departure from normals. Pretty much every county in Missouri has been below average since June 2nd. Ignore this uh, little bullseye right here. That's probably a, a, an error in some of the reports. But overall, Missouri, these dry areas are just really emerging quickly because of the lack of precip. A little bit of a pocket here of wetter conditions in Mississippi and Scott County. But overall, we're dry, especially the southern half of the state. We need some rain. And the heat has not helped anything. Obviously, when you get these hot conditions and little to no rainfall, we see large evaporative demand. So the ponds are dropping, the, the topsoils are bone dry in these drier areas. We need rainfall to replenish those surface and, and uh, water supplies as well as the water supply below the ground because things are drying out quickly with these high temperatures. And the next three days don't look terribly encouraging for high temperatures for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday especially the southern half of the state, upper 90s, perhaps even some low 100s. We had a few areas here in Columbia, we got to 100 degrees yesterday, right in the city. The last time we reached 100 was five years ago, back in July of 2017. So drought and heat do go hand in hand, and we were seeing plenty of dryness across the southern half of the state, and those temperatures are starting to get a little bit out of control in regard to triple digits or upper 90s. That's getting near record territory when you reach the low 100s. Nonetheless, the next three days do look hot, a little bit more cloud cover across northern Missouri, some better chances of rainfall over the next few days, so that'll keep temperatures uh, at bay for now, but it uh, looks like a cold front by Friday will be sagging through the state. Hopefully, as we go through the weekend, it doesn't look like cooler conditions statewide, so something to look forward to with cooler weather, cooler in parentheses, cooler weather for Saturday and Sunday. Minimum temperatures, again, look pretty intolerable. The high temperature or low temperatures in the upper 70s, that's unusual. That, and that's very muggy for tomorrow morning as well as Friday morning. A little bit better as that cold front starts to slowly sag through the state on Saturday morning with lows getting in the upper 60s across northern Missouri, but still in the low 70s across southern parts of the state. We are experiencing some heat advisories, excessive heat warnings statewide. The only exception is the far northern counties of Missouri. Uh, excessive heat warnings with heat indices in these magenta colors, anywhere from 105 to 110, that's seriously hot. You don't wanna be out in that long. And if you are, you need to drink plenty of water, wear light weight clothes, and obviously never leave kids or pets in the cars. This is very stressful. Um, and that's why the Weather Service has um, hoisted these excessive heat warnings and heat advisories over the next 24 to 48 hours. Lower left, these are thunderstorm outlooks over the next three days. That frontal boundary I talked about earlier, currently across Iowa, parts of Nebraska, that will bring better chances of showers and thunderstorms across the northern half of the state for today, this afternoon into tonight. That'll go a little bit further southward. Tomorrow, again, best chance for showers and thunderstorms across northern, even perhaps southeastern parts of the state. And uh, that frontal boundary will pretty much hang out, hang out across southern Missouri as we go into Saturday morning. So there still will be some scattered chances of showers and thunderstorms uh, statewide as we go into Saturday morning. This is the forecast over the next five days. Um, again, not terribly encouraging, but I will say it's very hard to forecast precipitation amounts in the summertime. They can be highly localized. As we saw earlier in the week, where one part of the county might get two inches of rain, another part might get nothing. That sort of pattern is going to continue over the next several days. This is a generalized map showing the highest likelihood of heavier precip over the next five days, generally across the northeastern half of Missouri, anywhere from a half to as much as two inches on the Iowa-Missouri border. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like southwest Missouri is going to see much. If they do, it will be more scattered and isolated storms. Again, we need the rain. This is the forecast over the for next week. A little bit, maybe perhaps some respite or relief from what we've been witnessing over the past several days. Back to more near normal temperatures across generally the northern half of the state that would put generally average highs in the mid to upper 80s for this time of year. Perhaps a slightly enhanced likelihood of above average temperatures for Southern Missouri. Looks like the highest likelihood for the hot weather is going to migrate more westward and into the Southern Plains. On the right, of course, this is what we're really paying attention to, is this precipitation. We need more rain. 
There are indications perhaps with that frontal boundary sticking around across the, the, the lower Missouri Valley into the Southern Plains that could bring some above average rainfall for next week. So that's encouraging. Near normal across much of the rest of Missouri, far Northeastern Missouri, it is clipping perhaps a, a slightly enhanced likelihood a below average precip. And one more slide, I do want to show this because I think it's very important. Um, there is a website in the lower right here. It's from the National Drought Mitigation Center, which is based at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And they encourage or they would like to get folks to report drought impact information. That is very useful for folks who look at this information. They make decisions when it comes to assessing drought and the, the categories of drought. And so it has impact not only at the local level, but it affects state and national decision making when it comes to assessing drought for our country. They're called Condition Monitoring Observer Reports. Again, here's the website. Once you get to this website, you can use a barcode or you can go to submit a report where this red circle here is and you fill out a survey. You geolocate your location and you put down the types of impacts that you are experiencing. These are just some examples. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for forwarding that information on this drought impact that came out of southwestern Texas County. No rain since June 2nd. Walnuts are falling off the trees. The grass is crunchy and grasshoppers are showing up and becoming a problem. That is an impact report due to the dryness. It's helpful information. And I've always said, who knows a drought better than a person who's living in that affected area? So again, I would encourage visiting this website and submitting your drought report. This one here in the middle from Wayne County talks about how dry and, and hard the ground is in regard to the uh, the dryness, and then this, you can submit pictures. Again, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a picture of a uh, stressed corn taken on June 28th in Cooper County, where it's been very dry. Uh, please feel free to submit these pictures. Again, it is a worth a thousand words in showing your impact. Debbie, that's pretty much a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. And, and I copied and put into the chat box uh, that website from University of Nebraska. And I had someone who called yesterday who said that the deer are eating all of her plants. Well, that's nothing new. However, what they're eating is plants that she has always put out year after year that they have never eaten before in the past. And so my thought process was, is that they're probably going after the moisture in those plants because it's been so dry. So a lot of things that are happening in our yards and in our gardens that we may not think about as why the reasons could be, but the weather definitely is something that does impact them. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and turn this over to Jennifer. She's going to be our moderator for today. So Jennifer, let's get started. All right, thanks Debbie. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm up here in Kirksville, Missouri, where we have been lucky enough to get a little bit of rain. We received a, a fourth of an inch here in the Kirksville area last night. We're gonna start off with a hosta question. The question is, we have hostas that I think are infected with the HVX virus because their leaves are curling and some of the leaves are dying. There are a few that don't seem to be infected. Can we replant others in the same area where we remove them? And Kelly is going to answer this question. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Can you uh, see this and hear me okay? I can see it and I can hear it or hear okay. you fine. All right, awesome, thank you. So yeah, um, we had a question about uh, Hosta X virus. And um, I will start out by saying for those of you that may not be familiar with Hostas, I know, you know, I, I often get questions from people that are new to Missouri and the types of landscape plants that we grow here. And I want to mention that if you are new to Missouri, hostas are a very popular shade plant for the home landscape. They're very beautiful. There are lots of different variations of colors and pretty flowers. I think last week we had a question about hosta flowers and if butterflies and pollinators like those types of flowers and the answer is yes. When my hostas are in bloom I am just constantly finding all kinds of insects hanging around so so they certainly like hosta blooms but uh, back to this hosta x so this is a pretty common virus in hosta 
And it was a, like a lot of insect and disease, issue, disease issues, it was accidentally introduced into the United States from overseas. And one of the things that you want to look for on your hostas if you suspect disease is collapsing leaf tissue, kind of a puckered appearance between the leaf veins. And we can see that here in some of these photos. And then another thing that you might notice is leaf modeling, M-O-T-T-L-I-N-G. And the, the picture here, um, the one on the very far left shows that leaf modeling. And basically what that means is it has blotches of lighter or different colored areas in the surrounding leaf tissue. Now do be aware that some hostas do this naturally. So know what cultivar you're dealing with and whether or not the leaf is supposed to have those kind of odd variations of color. So, so keep that in mind as well. So kind of the, the sad thing about this hosta X virus is sometimes the plant has it, but it's dormant inside of the plant for sometimes several years. So you could have purchased a plant somewhere and it was, it, it was infected with this virus, but it doesn't express those symptoms for several years down the road. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of easy ways to detect a virus on a plant. It, you can't tell it has the virus yet. Um, this is a virus that does spread to neighboring healthy plants uh, via sap and that sort of thing. So, you know, once again, I'm a big proponent in walking through your gardens once a week at least and just be on the lookout for things that don't look right, for leaves that might be discolored. And then if you do notice some of your hostas not looking right, you can certainly send a, a picture to any of us, any of the horticulture specialists in extension. Um, but, but just be on the lookout for some of these symptoms. And, you know, if, if you do have a plant that you're suspecting a virus, you need to get it out of there before it has a chance to spread to neighboring plants. So keep that in mind. Um, feeding from deer, rabbits, and slugs, you know, these are all notorious pests of hostas. And, you know, as these animals are feeding on these plants, they can pick up viral particles and then spread it to neighboring plants as well. Um, there's no evidence right now that is spread by insects, but we're always learning new things about different viruses. Um, and then whenever you're working with plants, make sure that you sterilize your tools between plants. You don't want to unknowingly spread disease and other things amongst plants this way. So there is no cure for this. Uh, so you need to dig up the plant and discard it in the garbage or by burning it and try to get all of the root system out of the ground. Uh, don't throw this on the compost pile because it won't survive the composting process. So that is um, this virus in a nutshell. And Jennifer, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, Kelly. And I guess I can report that uh, it is raining right now in Kirksville. And I looked at the weather radar and it is raining from Kirksville along Highway 63 up to the uh, Iowa border. And I really wish I could send it down to Wright, Texas, Douglas counties and all the areas of Missouri that are really needing rain. So we've been fortunate up here, but I really wish it could go south um, for, for you all. All right, moving on. The next question is about a burning bush that is having an issue. And the question is, I have a shrub that in a matter of a couple of weeks while I was away on vacation, sustained significant damage on half of it from something. I inspected the other half, which I still, or which I believe is still alive for signs of perhaps insects, but I couldn't see any. The dead leaves never dropped, but stayed on the limbs. The bark looks unusual and not like the bark of the live portion. It appears almost stripped. If you could please help me identify the issue and control, I'd appreciate it. So I'm gonna talk about this question. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, Debbie, can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Um, this is a euonymus. 
or burning bush. And the client sent these photos in and the affected areas are highlighted here by these yellow circles and arrow. And what we noticed, and I'll just tell you that a lot of us horticulture specialists looked at this this morning on our IPM conference. And we believe that it is scorch. And I wanna talk about some of the issues though here. So the, the bush is old. You can tell from the large stems at ground level, the big the tr um, stems coming out of the trunk are, are quite large. And I'm gonna show you some more photos that will show that even better. It is next to a house. It is near the, the eaves here. And what we know is that heat can be reflected from a house and it can cause scorch on nearby shrubs. So we do suspect that heat has been uh, reflected and caused the plant to become scorched. But let's look at some of the other things here. All right, so up at the top on the left, we have some healthy looking leaves. Doesn't look like there's anything wrong with those. And below that photo are dying leaves and stems. And over here to the right, we can see large stems coming out of the ground. All right, well, they to me appear to have some possible issues. If you look at the top, you'll see that there was a branch cut off of there at one time. Looks like it was probably pretty good size. Well, that there's that's a wound. And that's a wound where fungus could have entered, insects could have entered. And over time, it has just put the plant into decline. Moving over to the left a little bit, I think that looks like a crack. Now, without seeing this plant, we're not totally sure. All right, but when you get a big crack in a stem or the trunk of a tree or a shrub, that is cause for more problems, all right? Things can enter right there. So we believe that over time, a combination of things have been working on this plant. You know, it's an old plant, it's near the house, the soil under it may be compacted. Uh, there may be fungus that, have, that has worked on it, could have, you know, could be some insects. So we think just a number of things have played a role with the decline of this plant. And then it has been hot and it has been dry and the homeowner has been watering this plant. So this plant has received water, but in combination, all these things have taken a toll on this plant. So the actual browning of the leaves we believe is scorch. Okay. Probably from the heat being reflected from the house, but we believe that this plant is at the end of its life. So the homeowner, probably should be prepared to take out the shrub at some point and replace it. And probably not put in uh, such a large shrub that close to the house. We'd probably recommend something smaller, maybe something native. Uh, Euonymus is not a native plant. So we would uh, just recommend that the homeowner think about uh, a new shrub to replace this one. And this or these photos are showing you the inside of the stems. We've got a healthy stem, which appears very nice and white, and then an old stem that does have some brown in the center there. So something you know is working or could be working on the inside of that. So again, our recommendation is just to think about taking it out and replacing it. And then this photo just shows you how big that plant really is. So that's why we think it's just at the end of its life cycle or getting near the end. And that's why at this point, a replacement should be considered. And that is all I have on this question. Okay, we're gonna move on to a vegetable question now. And this is about cucumbers. My cucumbers are showing signs. They're showing signs of disease. White spots on the leaves. Some have holes, leaf curling on younger leaves. Do you think it's alternaria leaf blight? Do you have any recommendations for treatment? Preferably organic. And Donna is going to explain what is going on with this cucumber plant. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so this is what the cucumber leaves look like. Um, there were several of us that discussed this earlier. 
Uh, we really feel like uh, what, is, what is going on here is cucumber beetle feeding, whether it's the spotted cucumbers or the striped cucumber beetles, either or, or can be causing some of this damage. Uh, the reason why we don't believe it is necessarily a disease is we don't see the concentric rings that can show up and the yellow halos that can show up around the disease spots. And so this is um, very um, normal looking for having um, cucumber beetles feed on the tops of the leaves. And just to give you an idea of what these little critters look like, um, these are cucumber beetles. So we have two in the garden um, in Missouri that we have to contend with. Uh, one is the spotted cucumber beetle and the other is the striped cucumber beetle. Um, either or can be present or they both can be present. And I've seen that a lot where both of them are present. So um, a lot of times um, as juveniles, um, uh, they can be feeding on roots um, as the grub of, of these plants as well as a number of other garden uh, plants, but usually they don't do much damage in the grub stage. It's the adult stage that's uh, what we say is dangerous. And we, we say it's dangerous because these guys carry a disease on their mouth parts called bacterial wilt. And if the insects are let go, then you can have a death of plants. And so that is this next slide. And bacterial wilt um, is a bacteria that you cannot save the plant. You'll have to pull it. And so that goes back to really taking a look at how do you control those cucumber beetles? Um, really the threshold, when we, when we talk about threshold levels, that's how many can be out there before any damage is really done. Um, it's one to two beetles per plant up to the three leaf stage. So if you're just now planting cucumbers, um, and you are noticing these um, insects, then you need to get on top of it and get them controlled. Um, if they're older plants, it, it can, bacterial wilt can still happen, but the plants are usually um, very, they're growing well and, and they don't um, tend to be as bothered, but, but young plants can be devastated quite fast with some of these beetles. So once again, I always like to say with my garden at home, regardless of whether my plants are looking good or regardless of whether my plants are, um, you know, whether there's one beetle or five beetles, I'm gonna control them because I know how fast these plants can decline with uh, cucumber beetles feeding. Now, as far as chemical controls, um, you, normally we recommend a pyrethrin, neem, spinosad, uh, carbaryl, or bifenthrin. Um, now, carbaryl is what we call, normally gardeners call seven. Well, we have a, an issue with seven that it's no longer carbaryl as the active ingredient. ingredient ingredient. So we're usually saying seven is no longer seven. Um, it is now bifenthrin or cyfluthrin. Um, so just watch the active ingredients. If you want to be on more on the organic side, you're going to pick pyrethrin, neem, or uh, spinosad. If you don't mind using the heavier chemicals, then you might tend to lean towards the carbaryl or the bifenthrin. Now, there are other ways of contending with these insects, and I'll cover that in a minute. But I cannot underestimate the seriousness of these beetles um, as in regards to plant health and, and keeping your plants look good. Now, you know, with cucumbers, sometimes it's a challenge, a challenge for gardeners as well as us to figure out what's going on with them because there are so many things that can look alike um, the, the diseases. And so one thing I wanted to show everyone was um, those lookalikes. So on the far left, we have anthracnose, which is a fungal disease. And so a lot of times you will actually see um, diseases. Um, they will have, um, sometimes they'll have concentric, concentric rings in the spots. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll have yellow halos, but it's knowing what to look for. Um, some of the fungal disease goes um, as angular, some of them are more circular, some of them um, get bigger or what we call coalesce, and, and they have great big uh, spots um, where the spots join together. So um, it is always good to get things diagnosed and figure out what you're dealing with before you do any treatments. The second um, picture is actually aphids and aphid damage. And so as you, as you can see, you could almost look at this and think, oh, 
well, it's starting to do something. Maybe this is the beginning of the disease. And then the other one is a progression of the disease. So it's always good to know what you're looking at. And another thing that, that we're looking at here is that's ladybug larva. Anytime you see ladybug larva or ladybugs, you can be sure that they're, they're eating the aphids. And so that is, is always a good signifier. And over to the right, we have spider mites. I know my cucumbers every year get spider mites. And it doesn't always look like this. It looks sometimes more disease-ish. Um, is, is if you want to call it that. Um, but a lot of times if you flip the leaves over and you start tapping the leaves on white papers and, and you can see little specks moving, that spider mites. You can't see them with the naked eye typically. Some of the bigger ones you can, but normally no. But, you know, a strong jet of water in this case would help dislodge a lot of that. And, but on the flip side, if you use too much water, then you're going to trigger powdery mildew and downy mildew. And so that's just two more disease problems. So sometimes it's just best to get a hold of one of us when you start having cucumber problems and let's get it diagnosed and try to figure out what's going on before any treatment happens. With a lot of cucumbers, um, it's best to try to get um, treatment on early or try to prevent vet things early uh, because young plants do not, um, they're not strong enough to survive those cucumber beetles. So one thing I always try to encourage is consider using transplants instead of seed because then you get a three week jump start on those, um, those uh, beetles. The other thing you might consider is using floating row covers. That is a white thin uh, spun material that you just lay on top of the plants and it works as a barrier. You've got to block the, the, the blanket down though, or the floating row cover down because you don't want to climb it up underneath. But the challenge with that is you've got to get that off before they start blooming um, or as they start blooming in that way, uh, pollination can happen. Get those plants up off the ground, trellis them, make sure that um, there's no space for those uh, beetles to be hiding underneath the foliage. Get it up. Uh, you consider using kale and clay there. You can buy it online. It's a white uh, clay product that you can coat the leaves with and insects tend to avoid those leaves because they don't like eating that powder. Uh, scout the plants. And when I say scout, you're going to be looking at them. You're going to be walking by them every day. You're going to be paying attention and making sure things aren't going um, uh, bad. Uh, keep seedlings and young plants healthy. If you see things uh, yellowing or looking weak, you might uh, take a closer look. What's going on? Do they need to be watered? Do they need to be fertilized? What's going on? Consider a trap crop and a trap crop is um, you're planting plants a distance away um, that these insects are attracted to and you don't care what happens to that little patch. And so they draw away from the cucumbers and then you can kill the insects on the trap crop instead of what you're going to be eating. Um, and of course, apply a pesticide responsibly. And that means reading that label and making sure you're applying it correctly and you're not doing any damage with it. Because I know there's a lot of people that will get a hold of us and realize, oh, well, I just applied that wrong, or you applied it too close to the harvest date. So a lot of things can go wrong. So definitely read those labels. Um, and so it, with these tips, I hope that um, you guys can um, help your cucumbers grow healthy and nice and not have too many pest problems. But like I said, if you have problems, reach out to one of us and we'll gladly help you figure out what's going on. Okay, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Donna. Our next question is, do you recommend fertilizing asparagus and rhubarb in July? What kind of fertilizer is best for each? And Debbie is going to answer that question. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. So um, one of the things that, um, and there was a question in the chat box that started out asking about when is the best time to fertilize uh, peppers in this garden. And uh, what I, my comment, Kelly gave a really great answer and then I added to it. We've been finding a lot of soil test results when we get them back that there's high phosphorus and high potassium, very high or even excess. And usually that, that indicates that uh, there is consistent fertilization happening year after year. And in particular with what we call a complete fertilizer, uh, which means that there is a nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium in that particular fertilizer fertilizer and doing that year after year can build up on those fertilizers. And so when we're looking at and having really high phosphorus and potassium can be detrimental to plant growth as well, just as if you don't have enough fertilizers in the soil. 
can be detrimental to the growth. So we have to make sure that we know exactly what our plants need. So I'm starting out by saying that for the asparagus and the rhubarb, you really, really need to have a soil test done and at a minimum of every three years so that we don't have a, a huge buildup of these different nutrients in the soil. But looking at all of our materials that are out there that are research-based materials, generally for asparagus, they say one to one and a half pounds of a complete fertilizer, which is a 10-10-10 or 12-12-12, but they're recommending 10-10-10 per 1,000 square feet in the spring before the spears actually emerge from the ground. So that's one to one and a half pounds of 10-10-10 over 100 square feet. And after the harvest, you can apply a 0.10 pound of nitrogen per 100 square feet. And the reason for applying just nitrogen is that after the spears are gone, we get the asparagus fern. And it's that fern that actually grabs the carbon, makes the carbohydrates to actually create the food in the plant that goes back down into the roots in the fall to produce those nice spears for the next year. And that's all green growth. And so that's why we need the nitrogen. Asparagus does use a lot of potassium. It does not use very much phosphorus other than in the years where you're actually getting the crowns to set and to grow. And again, the nitrogen is used in small amounts when it's actually in the spear growth, more or less it's needed in the fern growth. And if you do add any fertilizer with this, you wanna actually do it alongside of the row. So kind of side dressing it and then just scratch it real lightly into the soil because those crowns can be real fragile. So when you're starting out, use the 10, 10, 10, but then make sure that you actually do a soil test. You may have to adjust that 10, 10, 10 to a different percentages of those different nutrients so that it matches what the requirements are so that you don't over fertilize the actual plants themselves. And then for rhubarb, again, do the soil test. Here, because rhubarb is a very large growing plant, it is gonna require more nutrients. So it says two to two and a half pounds of a complete fertilizer for 100 square feet, recommending a 10, 10, 10. You can do a, a light side dressing of nitrogen and or you can also add two to three inches of compost or manure and that's going to be composted manure after you actually harvest the stalks from the plant. It is a heavy feeder, but again, we recommend that you do a soil test so that you don't have buildups of nutrients in the soil that are gonna be detrimental to the growth of the plant. That's all that I have right now. Thank you. It's really important to know how to dispose of pesticides properly. And Sam Polly is now going to talk to us about how to do that. Okay. Can you see my slide okay? Yes, I can. All right. Okay, so I have limited time, so I'm going to try to burn through some of these slides as quickly as possible. And uh, if I get caught on any rabbit trails, you can just uh, cut me off and tell me my time's up. So I want to talk about disposal. And there, the first thing I want to bring up is that we're really talking about two issues. And the first one, obviously, is chemical, some kind of pesticide. But the one a lot of people don't think so much about is your container. And I see a lot of abuse with containers, even in, in backyards and farmyards and people's homes. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. If you take a look at this slide, these are some horribly inappropriate disposal issues that happen here in Missouri, where somebody was just dumping their trash and their pesticide containers in the creek. So you have these jugs and cans and all kinds of containers that were had chemical left in the containers. And this is a classic example of improper disposal. As these cartons break down in UV light, they rust, they release those chemicals into the environment. And something to keep in mind is that there are several modes of exposure to pesticides in humans. And these pesticides are designed to kill something. Well, if they kill, say, bees, they can kill humans because they have, you know, we have similar cell structures and, and enzymes 
And so this is a horrible example where bees were actually killed by a poor insecticide application, but the same thing can happen with pets, livestock, and people. So it's critical that we use pesticides properly and dispose of them properly. So here's a slide I showed in my last presentation. It just shows your organic copper fungicide. It's very safe, right? Well, you look at these, uh, the effects it can have on the body, there's quite a few effects of your average organic pesticide. So it doesn't even really matter what the chemical is. You wanna treat them all with respect and follow the label. That's what they invest so much money for is to create a label that tells us how to use and dispose and store these chemicals properly. So the most important thing any of us can ever talk about with chemicals and pesticides, read the label. We say it over and over, but so few people do it in reality, and it can save you a lot of pain and a lot of headaches and help you use the product properly. Now, this is a classic picture of a child playing with a pesticide container. I staged this photo just so you know. Um, she's actually very trained and washed her hands and this was an unopened carton. Just disclaimer there. But I've actually seen this kind of thing out in town. I mean, it's crazy how parents will use up a pesticide and the kids end up using the thing as a squirt bottle for a toy. It's like, no, 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 no. There are residues inside that container that will continue to release. This is that empty container isn't really ever empty. It's a hazardous item. So it needs to be properly disposed. So honestly, I haven't told a lot of people this, but I'm kind of a prepper and a hoarder. I like doing a lot of survival stuff and it's part of what my garden is, but the pesticide safety instructor in me takes precedence here. Pesticides are just not something you want to hoard. The more you have on hand, the more hazard, the more liability, the more risk you're exposing you and the environment and your neighbors and people around you to. So let the stores stockpile the chemicals, only buy the minimum you need. And that goes back to that previous slide. Read the label, try to calculate how much you're going to need in this immediate season and only buy that minimal amount. I can't emphasize this is enough. And this is how I always, when I was a commercial applicator, kept a minimal amount in storage. If that thing catches on fire or a tornado hits, it's that much less chemical that's going to go out there in the environment. So one of the little tricks I want to throw out there, I see this, in, Department of Natural Resources sees this all the time. People come in with these old degraded chemical containers. They don't even know what they are. So... This is a classic example where this carton was stamped. You can use an indelible pin. They actually use some indelible pin up here, but this is our release date when they took this out of the store. And that tells you how old it is. So years down the road, you forget, when did I buy that stuff? Oh, yikes, 2005. This is probably expired. <laughs> if it's more than two or three years old, you want to question how good that chemical is. It might be time to take it to Department of Natural Resources. So it's a really good idea when you buy it, just mark it with a pin so you know the date and you can stay safe. Now, <clears throat> when you mix a pesticide, you're not spraying concentrate typically out into the environment. It'll say something like four ounces per hundred gallons of water or a teaspoon per four gallon backpack sprayer, whatever the, the product happens to be. And so you're actually applying a very diluted solution out there. So it's not as bad as if you ruptured a carton of fresh chemical out of the store. And so when this stuff gets released, there are multiple modes of degradation in the environment. This is something you don't hear a lot about, but ultraviolet light is very good at destroying that chemical that you've hopefully just coated your plants or coated the soil with, depending on your application you're typically not just drenching your garden with some kind of chemical and soaking two feet down into the ground. There are some landscape applications, but typically for food crops and garden, you're just coating the leaves and then that UV light breaks those chemicals down, bacteria in the soil, the environment, and fungi, different microbes start breaking the stuff down. And then there's of course chemical reactions like hydrolysis and oxidation. So people don't realize how quickly chemicals are broken down in the environment by nature. And um, one of my good friends for his master's thesis, he actually did a study just like this slide shows here with oil spills, actually culturing the bacteria that would most quickly break down oil spills. And it was phenomenal how quickly some of these bacteria and fungi can tear down hydrocarbons and the most toxic chemicals. So it's amazing what the environment can do. 
Now, this is a, <laughs> we get into the, actually, I should back up real quick. One thing I forgot to mention is uh, this is one of the most critical things here. I couldn't really get a picture of it, but the final step after you've used up the chemical and you've sprayed it out, triple rinse the container. So as you're doing your last application, say you have one ounce left in the carton, you pour that in, you mix it with the right amount of water. Before you fill up the water, you triple rinse your container. So you fill the container a quarter full, cap it, shake it up real good, pour that into the tank and repeat that three times. Now your container is triple rinsed. It's adequately rinsed so that when it goes to the landfill, it's not releasing a lot of chemical. You still wouldn't want to drink out of it, but it's pretty safe for the environment. And so you actually use that rinse aid in the tank and then top it off to the maximum level you needed to mix with your, your concentrated chemical. Then you puncture the container, stomp it so it's crushed and throw it in a dumpster. That's the critical thing that kept us out of trouble as commercial applicators is constantly disposing our cartons. It kept us out of trouble with the agencies and it kept that those cartons off of our site because we had a lot of homeless people that would actually come around and get cartons and use them for water bottles and things like that. You don't want that on your conscience. They're using your Halex GT herbicide as a water jug. So, and kids can do the same thing. I've seen kids in kiddie pools playing with empty chemical bottles that obviously were not triple rinsed. And so this is one of the most important things I can say. So this is a, a photo DNR sent me from just their recent uh, chemical pickup. And this is lead arsenate, heavy metals banned 30 something years ago, very toxic. And look how dilapidated that label is. It's nasty, it's faded, it's stained with who knows what. And this is the kind of thing we want to get out of the environment. And what happens is a lot of times stuff gets banned, it gets canceled, or the label falls apart. There are many reasons people find themselves with some chemical and they don't know what to do with it. And that's really kind of the, the second phase. If you can't use something up, yeah, you're stuck with this chemical. You want to find where to dispose of it. The first step, store it in some kind of like plastic tote or some kind of container that's not permeable. So if it degrades or cracks, the stuff doesn't ooze out onto the floor of your storage facility. And then you want to make sure it's locked. This is one of the most important things I can't overemphasize. Please lock up your chemicals. If they're in your kitchen, your laundry room, your garage, make sure they're locked so kids and even kind of older kids don't, hey, let's do some experiment and mix some chemicals together. Just lock it up and reduce that liability. And then, of course, you want to follow a label. Label always has instructions about how to dispose properly. Now, here is an unacceptable photo. This is a real, this was not staged. This guy had, had been doing a bunch of, of pesticide application. He was just chucking the bottles in the back. You can see they're not slashed. They probably weren't triple rinsed. He had a bunch of residue in the, this tote. It rained. It actually overflowed and was all over the ground. Down here on the bottom, you see Department of Natural Resources test kit. They were finding traces all over the parking lot. It was a mess. It's so easy to avoid this. Just dispose of them as you go. You get one cart that's empty, get rid of it. You have a bottle, you don't know what it is or it's banned, take it to a collection event. It's not that complicated. And please never dump anything like this, any pesticides or cleaners down the drain or in a gutter, toilet, or out on the ground, because we do have collection events around the state. So this is more of a proper, what I was talking about, a, a impermeable tub, a plastic container here. And then in the back of a truck, this is being hauled from a farm to a collection event. And this is one of our collection events. Department of Natural Resources did, I think, five this year. And there's one more coming up here real soon. And it is phenomenal what's taking place here in Missouri. I'm very proud of Missouri for doing this. DNR has been absolutely wonderful. They just kind of open their arms and say, hey, if you're a household or a farm and you have some outdated chemicals, bring them on in on these events. We'll take them, no questions asked. And they're happy to take some illegal toxic stuff off your hands and properly dispose of it. They just get the satisfaction knowing it's being properly dealt with. And so this is what one of these looks like. Um, before I get to the end, I just wanted to say they've collected over 15,000 pounds of uh, old outdated pesticides just at the last event. I think over 140,000 pounds this season. The last event is coming up on August 13 in Versailles, 
and it's uh, going to be at the MoDOT maintenance facility from 8 to 12. So if anybody has any chemicals, take them there. It's worth the drive. So I forgot to start my timer, but I'm sure I'm almost out of time. So I just wanted to recap here. Use integrated pest management, which is just simply doing some common sense, using some scouting. Make sure the pest is there, and it's at a high enough level that it really needs to be treated. And uh, use other methods such as physical barriers like floating row covers or squishing the bugs on your leaves before you get to the pesticide stage. Once you have to use pesticides, read the label. They have that for a reason. And then buy the minimum amount possible. And uh, don't forget to label it with a date because sometimes you end up with something for two or three years. You don't quite use it all up. You miscalculate. And it's good to know what that date is. And uh, mix the minimum amount for the job, even if you have to mix two or three times, work your way up until the job is done. Don't just guess and make three times as much as you need. Don't forget, triple rinse on that one. When you get down, down on the line there, you're almost out of pesticide. You mix that last batch, triple rinse that container and dump it into the tank and then finish filling the tank with water. And then you can puncture that carton, crush it and throw it in the trash. And then, of course, store everything, whether it's stuff you're using or stuff you're going to dispose of in a locked impermeable system. Contact the waste authority. Um, I'm, I have some resources that we can send out some websites and stuff um, listing how to figure out who your waste management authority is when DNR collection events will be taking place. And so I think it's just a, a wonderful time to be involved in this and really be cleaning this state up. And you can all be a part of that. Spread the word. Neighbors have some kind of old scary chemical like chloridane or lead arsenate. They can take it and they get rid of it. So that's all I have. I don't know if there's any time for questions or anything, but uh, I have my contact information and you can track me down and with questions. Uh, Sam, we did have a couple of questions that came through in the chat. Um, someone was asking, once you triple rinse these big containers, can you recycle them like you would other plastic containers? That's a great question. So I don't have the name off the top of my head. I, I'm in contact with somebody that actually does have a specific recycling facility for the Midwest, and they do take pesticide containers. I wouldn't recommend throwing them in your like local recycling facility just because of the hazardous nature. I think triple rinsing, you know, scientifically has shown it really cleans them up a lot, but there's still going to be trace amounts of residue. That's why you wouldn't want your kids using them for squirt guns. Uh, but I can get that information and uh, we can send it out um, on the contact on who does that recycling. That's a great question. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you to both of you. And we're gonna wrap up our, our uh, garden hour here with our last topic. And that is going to be on spider mites because that seems to be a timely topic right now, especially with the hot and dry weather. And Kelly is going to talk about them. All right, just pulled up. Okay. Okay, yes, boy, I've been getting a lot of reports on spider mites lately, and spider mites love hot, dry summers, which, Jennifer, I'm really jealous that you're getting a lot of rain because, boy, we have not had a drop here in Springfield. I mean, very, very little. And um, yeah, spider mites love this type of weather. So I wanna share a couple of different things about spider mites. So they're basically small eight-legged pests and they feed on plant juices. They have what we call piercing sucking mouth parts. So they basically just suck out the plant juices. And spider mites can be different colors. They can be brown, red, green, or kind of cream colored. And you'll know that you have a spider mite issue if you see a uh, kind of stippling or I guess that's kind of what we call this leaf photo right here. We call that stippling. And that's just um, insect feeding damage that you can see with your naked eye. Um, you'll also notice a little bit of webbing, kind of like spider webbing. You might notice some yellow streaks and you can also do a paper test. And I've got a photo I'm going to show you here in, I think, the next or next to, next to last slide. Um, 
So as far as management goes, healthy plants are better able to fight off disease and insect issues. And of course, mites aren't an insect, but um, healthy plants are able to better able to fight these things off. So giving them lots of water during periods of drought, things like that. You can apply a dormant oil during the dormant season. Um, you can apply a miticide, and I'm gonna show you a photo of that in just a second. There are some natural predators that will feed on spider mites. So having a nice ecosystem in your garden with lots of beneficial insects can help. And spider mites are pretty weak and they're pretty small. So one thing that you can do is just go out and spray your plants down with a steady stream of water. Get um, an attachment for your garden hose that um, sprays the, the jet setting is what I like to use and just spray those plants down. That's gonna knock the spider mites to the ground, kill them and prevent them from climbing back up on the plant. All right, now if I can get my slide to advance, we'll go on, here we go. Okay, so this is spider mite damage on lavender and I scout my lavender research plants several times a week. And last summer we had a problem with spider mites and it kind of snuck up on me. And here on the top two photos, you can see this yellow leaf tissue and that is classic spider mite feeding damage. And you'll have to, you know, be on the lookout for it. it. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, just stand out to you until you have a bad problem. And so we used a miticide, not an insecticide, but a miticide did a one-time application and had a pretty good control of our plants. So do keep that in mind as an option um, if you do, you know, if it gets to the point where you have to apply something. And this is that piece of paper test that I mentioned. Basically, you just get a white piece of paper and you shake the plant above it and the spider mites will be dislodged and fall down to that paper and you can see them crawling around and see what you have there. Spider mites are kind of see, kind of hard to see with your naked eye while they're still on the plant, but if you can, you know, knock them off on this piece of paper, you're able to see them pretty good. But again, spider mites like hot, dry weather, which we're having right now. Um, they also like house plants, so so keep an eye on your house plants as well. And here's just some things you can do to um, take care of house plants that have spider mites also. And Jennifer, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kelly. And thanks to everyone that presented today. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Delly, or Debbie. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jennifer. So um, great information that we've had here. And so what I'd like to do is go ahead and I know that Donna had put into the chat box how to save the chat itself. And I'll just go ahead and show you here. Um, on your chat, there will be these three dots right here. Um, I'm sorry, it should be about right here when you, oh, I'm sorry, let's start over again. So in the chat, it says to everyone, there are these three dots right next to it. Just go ahead and click on that. And then it'll show another little box that'll open up and you can go ahead and click on that and say, save to computer or save it wherever you need to save that. Lots of great resources that were put into the chat box today. And again, as you all know, if you go to the YouTube channel, um, type in MUIPM, you'll see all of our snippets that we've done in the past. You'll be able to go back and see our live streams. Uh, if you've missed one or two, or if you want to go back and go, what was that that Sam said that again about pesticide disposal? You can go back and specifically look at that. And again, our upcoming times, if you've got something you would like for us to look at and have some pictures, go back out to where you signed up for the garden hour to start with at ipm.missouri.edu forward slash it is say town halls and then click on the garden hour and go ahead and put the information in there. And if you want to do a picture and send it to us, it is say yes. And it'll tell you how to up upload some of those pictures. And that's where that would happen. And here is who we all are. We're happy to say that we have a new horticulture specialist in the St. Louis, St. Charles County. His first day was yesterday on the job. So hopefully we'll get all of his information, Adam here, and be able to introduce you to him within the next week or two. 
With that, I would just like to say thank you for joining us and hopefully we'll see you all next week. Have a great day.